I hope you're having a great day. Well, I'm sorry for postponing yesterday's video, but today I want to talk about this little white device which I've had fixed in my arm for about 14 days. I posted this, a lot, of people, a lot of people have been asking what exactly that device is, and a lot of people have guessed it right. What it's called, it's called a CGMS monitor. This is a continuous glucose monitoring system. Now, a lot of people who have diabetes will know this because a lot of their doctors and diabetologists have, fit, have fixed this in their arm basically to give you a continuous reading of your blood sugar levels throughout the day. You know, we can go into the labs and we can get our pre-fasting, we can get our post-fasting, we can do our three-month average of HbA1c, and that gives us a lot of data. But when you're trying to heal a condition, when you're trying to heal diabetes, it's very important to know the behavior of food on your blood sugar levels throughout the day. Now, as we know, we're the diabetic capital of the world right now. India leads when it comes to type 2 diabetes. And like I always say, that is shameful because most type 2 diabetes is caused because of poor lifestyle. Type 1 diabetes, it could be hereditary. Sometimes we have no explanations why certain people get type 1. But type 2, 100% reversible. The only thing, the only obstacle that prevents us from reversing our own diabetes and type 2 diabetes is our lifestyle. Now, the question is, I don't have diabetes, touch wood, I'm grateful for that. But I decided to fix this CGMS monitor on me as an experiment and collect 14 days of data, 14 days of data which has changed my life, which has changed my perception towards the human body and nutrition. You see, it's very easy for all of us because it's what we study and what we do all the time to say, white bread is bad for you, okay? Too much of carbs is bad for your sugar levels. You know, protein is great for you. Fats are great for you. You know, a lot of exercise is great for you. You know, we go on making these statements, all of us, because, you know, our mindsets are constantly filled with the, with the facts of what we hear all the time, social media, what our friends talk about. So all of a sudden, everyone's scared of carbohydrates and people are trying to up, you know, load on protein and all of those things. So I said, let me do this experiment because I don't have diabetes, so I don't have fluctuations in my blood sugar levels. So I would use my body to put this little CGMS tracker on and over 14 days, I would eat every possible kind of grain, vegetable, fat, you know, because 14 days is a lot to, you know, to try with rice, to try with wheat, to try with dairy and so many different things, including sugar and chocolate cake and everything else. And what I do is I made a log of every meal and every time I check, you get a little reader with this, which your doctor would have. So in fact, we're going to have a live session with Dr. Akshat, one of the finest doctors I know, who basically fitted this into me because it can only be fitted in by a doctor, uh, by an allopathic doctor. And then they have a reader where they check your readings and you get these little graphs of your entire day and night, even while you're sleeping on your computer screen. So if I have a food log and if my sugar levels spike, I can, you know, I can relate it to my food log and say, okay, I ate this food and my sugar level spiked and it didn't come down or it went too low. So you're getting real data about yourself. You see, one thing that I go on about is every individual is unique which is why if you have one disease and you're trying to treat it the same way as everyone else, you know, you're not gonna get the same results. Yes, in the medical world, you need, you need one drug for the symptom, no matter who the patient is, their caste, their creed, their age, or whatever it is. But when you look at the holistic way, when you're using food as medicine, when you're using your lifestyle as medicine, what you want is accurate data about yourself. So I'm gonna share, I'm gonna share what I learned about my body and the kind of food and exercise that I need uh, once I go on why sugar levels are so important. So you see, this little monitor tells you exactly, you have a blue, you have a blue graph over there. And as long as you stay within that level, you're perfectly fine. You eat a food, your, your sugar levels spike up within that, within that level and it comes back down again. It may spike over if you've had a carbohydrate that's had that kind of impact on your sugar levels. Now, two things that we need to understand, it's not just high sugar levels that is a problem in your blood. We all know the dangers of having high blood sugar levels. The first thing is it damages the vessels that supply blood to all of your vital organs. So you talk about kidney disease, you talk about people getting onto dialysis, you talk about heart disease, you talk about strokes, you talk about inflammation, you talk about paralysis, you talk about low libido and a low sex drive, you talk about the inability to lose weight. High blood sugar levels plays a role in all of these things, which is why it is so important for us to control and reverse our type 2 diabetes if we can. Because just keeping them in place isn't going to solve your problem because you still have vessel damage to your kidneys, your nephrons, and everything else. So on paper, your blood parameters may look really good and you think you're healthy, but you still have a problem, which is why we encourage people to work with the root cause of their type 2 diabetes and eventually reverse it. 
So what causes high blood sugar levels? Of course, your diet, lack of exercise, lack of sleep, sleep deprivation, high stress levels have a direct impact on your blood sugar levels going up and staying up. So these are all the things with high blood sugar levels. But let's talk about low blood sugar levels because in my graph, I had several instances in a day where my sugar levels actually dipped below the graph into red, which means I had low blood sugar levels. Now, how is that bad for us? The first thing we need to understand that every one of the cells in your body, that could be trillions of cells in your body, they need energy. They need energy while we're awake, while we sleep, to, you know, to handle every single function in our body, physical, mental, emotional, every single function is out of a cell which requires energy. Now, if my blood sugar levels flow, uh, fall, if any of your blood sugar levels fall, what happens is we're depriving these cells of energy, which means it can compromise our immunity, it can compromise our energy levels. We could have a drop in energy levels during the day and be fatigued, and then we think the solution is more caffeine or more sugar or more food or more carbohydrates, where all the only problem was your blood sugar levels dipped a little bit. and Your body instantly responded with fatigue and all of these symptoms. When you drink too much of alcohol at one time, your blood sugar levels will now fall because of the action on the liver. So if you're constantly drinking and binge drinking and you're not eating, your blood sugar levels can fall, which means you are depriving every cell in your body of energy, which is why we become more acidic in the first place. We alter the pH of our blood. So all of these things can happen, including over drinking alcohol where you can have a drop in your sugar levels. Most people think the opposite, that I'm drinking alcohol, alcohol becomes sugar in my blood, so my blood sugar level should be high. But it actually works the opposite. When you drink too much of alcohol, your blood sugar levels will actually fall. Some people get breathlessness and heart palpitations and these little tremors. Sometimes it doesn't have to be a heart problem. Even a drop in your blood sugar levels, a little drop in your blood sugar levels could lead to heart palpitations and tremors and breathlessness. And you could get really worried about these symptoms, but all you had was a drop in your blood sugar levels. Over-exercising and overtraining. If you're training so hard, you are gonna have a drop of glucose in your blood and you are gonna have a drop in your blood sugar levels. And that's when your workouts become dangerous for you. So if you don't have a great pre-workout and a great post-workout meal and your blood sugar levels are gonna fluctuate and go even low, you know, a lot of your workout is quite useless because everything in the body revolves around your hormones and your blood sugar levels as well. So if you have low blood sugar levels, there's no way you're building muscle. There's no way you're building muscle tone, which means you're actually allowing more fat to form in your body. This can happen when you have high blood sugar levels and when you even have low blood sugar levels. Now, the next thing is, so if you keep long gaps between your meals, your intermittent fasting, when you're perfect at that, what happens is your pancreas produce something called glucagon. This is when there's no more, there's when your blood sugar levels are really low. So if your blood sugar levels fall now below the level, your pancreas, if they're working perfectly, will produce something called glucagon. This acts as food and signals to your liver to release the stored glucose into your blood and then your blood sugar levels come up and everything is fine. That's how the human body learns to adapt. But when we're missing meals erratically and we have erratic meal timings and stuff like that, we don't follow the biological clock. We have these dips in our sugar levels that could be creating a lot of problems with our metabolism, our muscle, our digestion and everything else, which is why it is so important that you also make sure that you don't have low blood sugar levels. When you have low blood sugar levels, there's one hormone gets, get, that gets released into your blood system. That is cortisol. We all know what cortisol, cortisol is a stress hormone. Your blood sugar levels fall. The human body wakes up thinking I need more energy. This is a stressful situation. I'm not getting food as energy. So what happens is it starts releasing cortisol in your blood. And if we have cortisol in our blood for elevated time, for, for a long time, we have everything to do with stress, right? From an increase in inflammation, heart rate, cholesterol, everything in the human body changes when we have stress hormones in our blood for a very, very long time. So keeping your low blood sugar levels means you have more of the stress hormones. Anxiety, irritability, sometimes your hands get clammy, your skin feels cold, you feel cold even if you have a jacket on. All of this could be with, caused by just a drop in your blood sugar levels. There could be several other reasons, but I'm giving you an example. You may check everything else, but sometimes all you need is to improve your blood sugar levels and all this anxiety, irritability, and all of that stuff can actually disappear because that's exactly how the body is gonna respond when the blood sugar levels drop. So this is the importance of, of uh, maintaining our blood sugar levels. Now, coming back to our study, what we did, so I collected data for 14 days. I indulged in different days. Dr. Aksha, who's my doctor, 
basically told me that, you know, have a different day where you try different grains and stuff like that. And like I said, everyone out there thinks white rice is bad. Everyone, everyone out there thinks white bread is bad. Yeah, it's processed food. It's all of that. So we should have it in moderation and stuff like that. But you'd be surprised to know that food behaves differently in so many people. Carbohydrates, which could be a poison to some people, can actually be beneficial for other people. So it is so wrong to make a claim and say the way to lose weight is everyone should go low carb. It doesn't have to be the way because we see in our own data every single day, some people, we put them on high carb, high protein diets and they start losing weight, their sugar levels fall in place and some people need low carb diets. Some people need low carb and high fat diets. It's different for everyone. So what happens is over the next, over the 14 days, this is what I found out. These are the uh, white bread has absolutely no, absolutely no negative effect on my sugar levels. So I can have a white bread sandwich and my sugar levels will behave. I can have white rice and khichdi at every meal and my sugar levels stay in place. Now for some people it could spike up your levels right away, but like I said, everyone's different. What I learned is your pre-workout meals and your post-workout meals have to be perfect. Because if I did a workout, okay, I found two hours later that my blood sugar levels were dropping even if I ate a meal. But what does this tell me? That my post-workout meal was not sufficient, which means I needed to eat more. My quantity of my post-workout meal had to be higher to suit my body type so that my blood sugar levels stayed high. What I also found out was doing a workout towards the latter part of the day. You know, you wake up in the morning and your sugar levels are, have dipped because you don't have enough of food in your system. Now, I'm talking about myself. This could be completely different. What I'm trying to show you is that it be it's different for everyone. So if you're at that stage in your life, you don't have to have diabetes where you've tried everything. It makes sense for you to log your food for 14 days and see how every food has an impact on your blood sugar levels. What I also know, noticed was lack of sleep. The day you sleep lesser, your blood sugar levels start behaving erratically for the rest of the day. So even sleep deprivation has an impact on your own blood sugar levels. Another thing that I noticed was if I change my meal timings, I have my lunch at a different time every day, I have my dinner at a different time every day, you know, I change my biological clock. Your body is expecting food according to a biological clock, not according to our priorities and our day. So if we can feed ourselves at almost the same time every day, blood sugar levels start to behave the right way. I also found out that having one or two cups of chai with sugar in didn't impact my blood sugar levels at all. And here we go around telling people don't have chai with sugar and don't do all of that stuff. It may be the right advice for people where it's affecting them. But if it doesn't have an impact on your blood sugar levels at all, you know, you don't really have to worry about it. Now I'll tell you what really worked negatively for me. If I had too much of protein at one time, there was a day I had three eggs at one time and my blood sugar levels shot right up. Now that's very funny because we don't believe that protein, a high protein diet can create a spike in sugar levels, but my body type, it did it. Dr. Akshat's gonna share his story on Friday where something like Bajra, which is a protein again, shot up his levels. So you see, it's different for everyone's body, which is why it's so important for us to understand that we're unique. And if we're trying to find a solution, doing something as simple as tracking your blood sugar levels for 14 days will tell you exactly what food suits your body, what kind of exercise suits your body, the number of hours that you need to sleep and how stress has an impact on your sugar levels as well. Now, I mainly did this test because of the dry fasting and the intermittent fasting. So what I realized and what I keep telling people, people keep saying 14, 16, 18, 20 hours. It doesn't matter. Your body will tell you when to break the fast. My body tells me to break a fast within 13 to 14 hours. If I push it to 15 hours, my blood sugar levels dip. And I don't want that happening. The very fact that I'm breaking my fast because my body's told me to, it means that my body is now moving to the building phase and it is asking for food. Just trying to extend the fast because it sounds fancy and everyone's doing 14 to 16 to 18 hours doesn't have to be the right solution for you. Because if it's creating a drop in your blood sugar levels, it's not really impacting you in a positive way. So it is so important for us to listen to our body because not everyone's going to do this and you don't have to do it. I'm just trying to tell you that listen to your body. If your body breaks your fast tomorrow in 13 hours, break your fast. Another day it may be 16 hours, follow 16 hours. Another day it may just be 12 hours, follow 12 hours. Because what I learned from this entire test is that every single human body is unique and different. So we cannot make a claim that this food 
should not be right for you or that food should be good for you. It could be causing a problem because everyone's different. Now, people with type 2 diabetes, it is so important for you to work with your diabetologists and your doctors and once and for all, especially if you've been struggling with your type 2 diabetes, get this fixed onto your arm. Any of your doctors can do this for you. Get it fixed onto your arm because 14 days of data will tell you exactly what suits you. So instead of everyone trying to guess that, oh, brown rice is bad or brown bread is good for me or white, white rice should not be in my diet, let the data speak for itself. In most cases, you'll find that like kitchenies and white rices mixed with vegetables really don't interfere with your blood sugar levels at all. But having that with a sedentary lifestyle, the more you're sedentary, I took a weekend, Saturday and Sunday off completely from exercise. I didn't even walk. And I could see fluctuations in my blood sugar levels within the healthy graph, which means that activity also has a positive impact on our blood sugar levels. So this is a simple test that anyone can do. You know, it's, it does, it's not painful at all. Like, you know, if you just pinch yourself a little hard, that, that's exactly, the, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, discomfort you'll have when your doctor's putting this in you and your doctor's supposed to remove it and he'll give you all your readings over 14 days. The important part is track your food because if you see a spike, you want to relate it to which food you ate. So after a while, like for me, I've realized that protein has to be spaced out throughout the day. Instead of having too much of protein at one time, I need to space it out through the day. But carbohydrates, I can eat a full carb meal and my sugar levels will behave absolutely the right way. So it's as simple as that. And this is what we want to understand. We want to understand more about our bodies and how our bodies work in relation to exercise, sleep, the kind of food that you eat, your stress levels. So in, 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 instead of everyone guessing and telling us what to do, I right now know for the rest of my life, the foods that suit my body, the foods that I can indulge in without any guilt and the foods that I need to space out to maintain my blood sugar levels. So you could say this is a once in a lifetime test that anyone can really do. And if you're type two diabetic, I definitely, definitely recommend that you work with your doctor to get this because you can't argue with your data. And then the biggest problem with type two diabetics is that they resist certain foods. They don't want to make changes. But when the data, when you see the data of how that food is really the cause of your high blood sugar levels, you start to make those changes because this is not a human being telling you, it's data telling you how that food behaved in your body. Have a great day, everyone. Until next time, eat smart, move more, sleep right, and breathe deep.